Okay. Uh, well, here we go. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending this uh, presentation. And thank you, HiFinQ, for inviting me to give this, this talk. I'm uh, Jose Granero. I'm the head of strategy and customer experience at Neuron Connectivity Systems, an industrial software company based in Spain, specifically in Madrid, although our team is located uh, worldwide. Um, uh, our, um, our company uh, mainly has a flagship product, Neuron, which is an all-in-one industrial uh, software for uh, building IoT and data ops applications. Uh, the company, uh, Neuron Creativity Systems, was founded uh, by system integrators. Uh, many of us in the company have an extensive background in system integration, digital and transformation and operational technologies in general. And also many of us have uh, worked in the past, have performed different roles in uh, multinationals in the energy industry, such as Engie, Sun Power, uh, Siemens Gamesa, etc. Um, also some, um, well, uh, most of our clients are in the energy sector uh, along the whole value chain, ranging from uh, owners, to companies that provide operation and maintenance services, uh, as well as software as service platforms for uh, asset management. And that's why today I'm going to try and give you an overview of how these clients are currently using both Vanilla NXTT as well as Sparkplug in real use cases for integrating their assets with uh, their infrastructure. Okay, uh, what do, do our clients need when they start an IoT project or a digital transformation project for their renewable power plants. For this, they, they usually have the, a common goal, which is a common goal to other, many other industries and, and, and sectors, it's the, always the same, uh, to gain better insights into their processes, to make better decisions that allow them to be um, more um, competitive, more flexible, more efficient. Uh, here we have some um, quotes from uh, a few customers of ours. First, we have Trender from Biowa Americas. He said, he, he said here he says that he, they needed something to speed up customer integration and reduce costs. Uh, then um, Dinner Rathod from Adani Adani Group in India. Again, very insights, no more comprehensive information and a scalable, feature-rich, and reliable solution. And finally. Uh, here we have Miguel Hernando from Delta Tech, a Spanish company, who um, uh, brings a major concern in this industry, which is security and, and data consistency. Because uh, while it's true that uh, nearly any digital uh, infrastructure is acceptable to cyber attacks, it's also true that uh, a successful cyber, cyber attack on uh, a power plant, the, the grid, or uh, uh, water uh, supply facility would be much more harmful uh, impacts to population than on any other types of, of assets. Well, um, here's the list or with uh, uh, here's the list that our clients usually bring to us when uh, exploring a, a possible solution. It, and this list usually contains, if not uh, if not all, most of the of the points uh, listed here. First of all, they uh, normally have many remote sites, uh, sometimes several hundred sites, and uh, they want the, the, the architecture, the infrastructure, the infrastructure they deploy to be able to um, uh, integrate uh, their entire portfolio and with, their, with the ecosystems uh, of applications they, they have, whether it's a SCADA, a CMMS, uh, an asset management system, data lakes, historians, whatever. Um, another major requirement is scalability. They need to make sure that the um, architecture is going to be capable of growing uh, uh, together with the, whenever they need to add new plants, okay? And um, security and their integrity, uh, as I mentioned before, this, uh, uh, this is a very sensitive uh, type of asset to, to cyber attacks. So they play significant uh, emphasis on security measures, such as their encryption, et cetera. Um, they also need to increase availability to 
receive warnings and alarms whenever uh, there's a, a piece of equipment is underperforming or uh, goes down in order to guarantee that the plant keep ups, keeps on producing at full output. Improve efficiency and maximize profitability. Uh, uh, they usually are looking for something that allows them to lower operation and maintenance costs. And um, also, as a trend set in the, in the previous slide, reduce time and cost for onboarding new plants. And given that this is a strongly regulated um, industry, uh, for example, uh, regardless of the, of the country, uh, many, many plants have to send um, some metrics in real time to the system operator or, the, or a company acting on behalf of the, of the system operator. Uh, and on the other hand, they also uh, have to follow in a timely manner the curtailments uh, sent by that uh, system operator and meet warranty requirements, which is something I'm going to take uh, more in detail later on, because it specifically applies uh, to battery energy storage systems. OK, well, um, so far we've seen the, the needs, but what are the challenges? Well, first and foremost, the lack of interoperability. Usually, uh, we encounter um, many different protocols in, when in, in trying to integrate a, uh, power generation on plant. Uh, some of the some of these uh, data sources are legacy systems, which uh, are true data silos that not, don't exchange data with any other systems. And uh, of, of course, there's a huge variety also of data formats because of the of the of the number of, of protocols. Uh, this is something that I've wanted to illustrate with this a picture here on the left. This is a control panel with a um, controller from uh, an unknown manufacturer I had to deal with a few years ago when I uh, led the digital transformation project uh, of uh, NG Spain for all the hydropower plants there. Here's, I've also added a short video, which also illustrates the, the number of protocols uh, you usually need to use when trying to integrate the, the different assets, in this case, in a, in a PV plant. No? We have trackers, we have uh, inverters, string combined boxes. Um, beside Modbus, opc UA, opc -DA, there are many other proprietary protocols for all these pieces of equipment. Usually, these uh, plants are in, in remote sites, so uh, they communicate on unreliable and, and bad with the limited uh, networks. Uh, for example, on, via satellite. And uh, of course, uh, we have the need to integrate data from, from multiple systems. And this can be a problem, especially when there's a lack of IT infrastructure. Uh, again, fear of exposing operational systems to cyber threats. Uh, as I said before, security is a major concern in this industry. And uh, stringent regulations, uh, uh, some some, in some countries, there can be severe penalties for those owners that do follow curtailments in a timely manner. Finally, we take schedules and decreasing budgets. Well, given that the system integration tasks and, uh, are the last in the are in the last phases of every project, they uh, is uh, quite often that they have to uh, um, compensate the delays accumulated until that point in the in the project and decreasing budgets given the fierce competition in, in renewables nowadays. Uh, sometimes budgets uh, fall short and this may have an impact on, on quality. And lack of standards here, we don't have anything similar to ISA 95 or a reference model that tells us how to build our, our models for, for these types of, of power plants, for these power plants. And lack of skilled human resources and lack of knowledge, this uh, can result in wrong decisions, delays, and even sometimes in project failure. Okay, so we've seen the needs, the challenges, but what's the right approach whenever you uh, want to uh, start an, an IoT project at large scale and ensure scalability? Well, very much like in manufacturing industry here, a uh, unified space-based architecture also sets the right foundations for uh, future-proof scalability. 
So uh, I guess that most of you are familiar with the Unifund Space Concept. Uh, it's a distributed architecture that allows to connect all data sources and consumers to, to the ecosystem. Uh, it implements uh, data governance. It makes uh, the data available to everyone in the same way. It uh, allows adding, uh, normalizing and contextualizing this data and putting with the, phone with the right structure in the, in the hands of the people who, who have to use that data. And uh, it's a, a kind of insurance for scalability because uh, as far as I know, there's no other architecture as scalable as uh, unified space nowadays. Um, on the other hand, it uh, improves data-driven decision making because uh, it uh, uh, let, lets uh, data flow from the operational from the operational side to the guys to the C-level guys who, who have to make the strategic decisions. And finally, given that somehow it allows automating uh, data management, it um, um, lets the teams focus on more strategic tasks than managing data or how you have to integrate the, the different assets. And well, NQTT, I'm, go I'm not going to spend much time talking about NQTT. Uh, 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 as you already know, it's uh, the most extensively used protocol for uh, deploying a unified, a unified space based architecture nowadays. It's open, it's, uh, it's driven, it reports by exception, so it uh, reduces the usage of the, bandwidth, of the bandwidth by 80%. Uh, it's secure, it's built on top of the TCP, so you can implement uh, TLS encryption. Uh, brokers uh, allow implement, uh, have built-in mechanisms for authorization and authentication, and uh, it also has a built-in mechanism for store and forward, which was one of the uh, biggest concerns of, uh, of the owners of these types of assets. And uh, Sparkplug, Sparkplug is an open specification built on, on top of uh, MQTT. It's uh, fully open, anyone can implement it. The specification is available in the Eclipse Foundation and also in the ISO. And uh, so anyone can implement it in their software, in, in their hardware. And uh, it's, uh, it tailors MQTT uh, for uh, industrial uh, use cases. And um, to me, the magic of uh, Sparkplug, I know there's a, lot, there's a lot of discussion nowadays whether it's suitable for all use cases or not. To me, it's a kind of magic and it's very suitable for many applications out there, especially for wide uh, area SCADAs or not necessarily SCADAs, okay? Um, because once you define the data model down, on, uh, down at the edge and use templates, for example, it automatically allows you to uh, push that, uh, that data model to the, the applications that subscribe to the, to the infrastructure. Uh, what does it look like? Well, this is uh, an example with Neuron. Here on the left-hand side, we have a data model created uh, in, with one Neuron node at the edge, okay? And, which is, uh, and this node is publishing the data to an NQTD broker. Um, here we have another central node which subscribing to which has is subscribed to the data coming not only from that um, remote node but from many other plants in this case in Spain. Uh, let's go with some real use cases. This is um, this is an Indian company uh, which has over 100 sites. This is the architecture they had until 2018. Okay, uh, a bit uh, outdated uh, architecture. Uh, they were using Neuron as a kind of data logger to collect the data from all the systems and devices in the, in the plants where they had different technologies, no? wind farms, PE plants, and of course storage. And uh, they were uh, building these uh, CSV files according to periodic triggers and uploading them to a central SFTP server where uh, this data was eventually ingested into the databases of their ENOC, the Energy Network Operation Center. So in, in 2021, we managed to, because they were quite reluctant, 
we managed to convince them to move to something more updated, MQTT. And uh, so uh, this is what they're using right now. And they keep on using the, the same concept every time they have to onboard a new plant. No? They deploy uh, MQTT client down on, in, in the neural node and they automatically connect it to their, to their infra infrastructure. Um, but funnily enough, uh, this client in particular asked us to um, implement something that goes against the very essence of MQTT, that is snapshot node. Even that uh, MQTT is edge driven, it's a re it uses reports by exception, no? But they ask us to implement this snapshot mode, which takes snapshots of the, of the data model and publishes to, to the broker every uh, minute, I think. Uh, why? I guess that it's because they didn't want to change much than the ETL processes they have with the previous uh, solution. This is another use case. This is um, another uh, multinational company in in USA in uh, that they have plants not only in, well, mainly in California and also in Mexico. And this client specified Sparkplug from, from the scratch, uh, from the beginning, because they have a very well-known uh, uh, SCADA in their remote operational control center, California. And uh, what they are doing is more or less the same. They uh, connect to all the devices and systems in, in the plant using different uh, neuron uh, modules and are exchanging data with the broker via Sparkplug. Here they have their SCADA, but they also added another host application, a software as service platform for asset management that uh, by the time they chose to go with this uh, software as service uh, provider, they didn't have uh, implemented the Spark plug yet, and uh, they asked them to, to do it in order to, to start using it. So there are more and more companies that are starting to use Spark plug. This is another interesting use case in Spain. Uh, here we have a company that provides uh, loads uh, dispatch, uh, that is acting as a load uh, dispatch center. So they have specified a neuron to be deployed at the edge by all their clients, and uh, they connect to the power mirrors to, um, to retrieve uh, voltage, active power, reactive power, and the state, uh, the state of the main contactor. And uh, on the other hand, they send the curtailment and the region of the, of the curtailment. And, but they also uh, started a couple of years ago to uh, provide an additional service to the clients because they certify the green origin of the energy that is being producing, producing the plants through a, a software as service uh, platform that uses a blockchain and that communicates on, on, on NQTT uh, too. And uh, this is the last one. This is uh, a Canadian company who has a lot of uh, plants uh, with uh, battery energy storage systems. And their major concern was that they didn't want, they, 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 need, they needed to make sure that they weren't going to lose any data because uh, battery manufacturers obligate uh, the clients to uh, store uh, huge amounts of data for a, long time, for a long time in order to keep the warranty. So uh, they decided to uh, go with this architecture. They have neuron and they are uh, uh, publishing everything to to the broker, and finally they have a central neural node deployed in the, up in the cloud, we subscribe, we subscribe into all the data sent by the, by the remote nodes, and eventually ingest this, ingest, uh, this data into that uh, central data, the data warehouse they have with um, time scale. Well, so now let's go with a demo. Uh, a plug and play solution to, to integrate uh, PV plants with um, AWS IoT setwise. This is the architecture. Here on the left hand side, we have several PV plants, okay, where again we have neuron to connect to all the devices and systems on, in the plant and uh, using Spark plug, we're going to exchange this data with uh, hyphen Q cloud. And using uh, this component available in, in the uh, in uh, AWS Marketplace, we're going to see how automatically our data model 
is recreated up in, in IoT setwise. Not only the data model, but also the templates, because here we are going to make use of the something that is one of my preferred features of Sparkplug, that is templates. Well, first, uh, we're going to uh, create a hyphen Q cloud instance. Now, for that, uh, we go to the to hyphen Q website and sign up. We've already done it and logged in our, our cluster. Now we go to access management, and here we've created a couple of uh, a couple of users for Neuron and and for uh, IoT Bridge. I recorded the video. I recorded the video to prevent the, the demo effect, you know. <laughs> so now, now we go to AWS uh, Marketplace. Uh, let's uh, deploy an, an instance of IoT Bridge, which is an AMI. So when you deploy it, it automatically creates uh, a user. Uh, to access the sideways service in the same region where, where you deploy it. All you have to do is to, to continue, subscribe, continue to configuration. Now here, let's select a cloud formation, the template, to deploy everything. Let's select the region where we want to deploy it. And all we have to do is to click launch, easy PC. Um, now, once we, we've uh, deployed the uh, IoT bridge, we go to CloudFormation to see that it's up and running, and we can take a look at uh, the resources it has deployed. If now we go to site to, all we need after that is to access the EC2 instance via SSH and configure only the connection to the hyphen Q broker. The URL, user, and, and password we created previously in HyphenQ Cloud. I'm not going to explain uh, how to do that here because it's uh, very well explained in the documentation of IoT Bridge. And if now we go to Sidewise, we're going to see how it automatically has created some uh, asset models for internal use, as well as this instance also for internal use to display the, the number of connected clients, etc. Once we've created the, the infra app in the cloud, let's go to Neuron, okay? And here we have, we're going to access it via, from any web browser, let's log in. And here we've already created some module instances to connect to some devices. For example, IEC 104 to connect to IEDs and uh, RTUs, IEC 102 and DLMS to connect to power mirrors. We have also derived tax to calculated statistical values, for example, the average of the power, active power every 15 minutes, or the uh, irradiance every 15 minutes, or the performance ratio of the plant, etc. And now, uh, let's imagine that we need to connect to some inverters who are communicating on OPC UA. For that, let's create a new module instance to connect to, to the server that is uh, exposing this data. We go to the model panel, let's select new module, uh, let's give it a consistent name, OPC UA client. Select the functionality from this drop down menu. Run all the options available, OPC UA client, okay. Save the changes. Save the changes again in the spare panel. And now in the in the model uh, panel, we are going to create create a, a, a connection to the to the server. Select new client, and let's name in data sim M3. And here we can configure the connection by entering the URL uh, of the server, datasim.neuron.com, and the port by default, used by OPG UA 4840. Click on find endpoints. And in this case, the server uh, has only one endpoint available, none, none. Let's select it. Now let's authenticate with the, with the server. Save the changes again. And now we can go to the Explorer panel again and browse the server. Here we can see that there are, there are many repetitive uh, structures, many inverters, uh, weather, uh, weather stations, cabins. So it makes sense to start creating templates. For that, 
we're going to drag and drop, for example, the inverter to the templates panel, save the changes again. And if now we go to, 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 tax com to the tax configuration section, we can change the name of, uh, of the template to something more generic, add a custom property or as many custom properties as we need to configure everything. Let's create a custom property name device. And we can start using this custom property down in the configuration of the, of the tax. For example, in Active Energy, we go to the node ID. And here we can build an expression to concatenate uh, some uh, text strings and enter the value of the, um, enter the, the custom property we've just created between curly braces. Here in the output, the uh, neuron is telling us how it has solved that expression. There's a gap because we haven't configured any default value for the, for the custom property, so it's uh, correct. And if we save the changes, we can create an instance of that inverter by dragging and, and dropping the, the template in the, in the model and giving it a name and entering a value for the single custom property we've created. Save the changes again. And if now we move to real time, to the real time panel, we should see that the only tag we've modified, the first one, displaying with, with a good value, with good, good quality. Now we uh, should proceed the same way. You know? We could export everything to a CSV file in order to uh, configure our template much faster. And we would keep on creating templates, nesting a template into another, creating com more complex uh, structures, but given that we don't have time, Let's import the templates we need for this particular use case. And let's also import the, the data model where we've used these templates. Here, here it is. The green color indicates that these are instances of these templates. So if we made any changes to the template, this would be automatically inherited by all those instances. and. Uh, here we can see, for example, how uh, there are some, uh, the values of some custom, pro some custom properties are automatically being inherited from a parent in, in the hierarchy. That's the right way to, to work with templates in, in Neuron when created a complex, uh, complex uh, data structures, data models. And once we have our, our data model, what we are going to do is to publish absolutely everything to the hyphen Q uh, cloud cluster. Here we have all the tags coming from, from the plant. And now let's create a new, a new instance of our Spark Plug Client module. Select again the functionality of the module from the total menu, Spark Plug Client. And following the, speci the, the specification, now we are going to create uh, a group, which is going to be the, to which we're going to get the, the name of our fictitious company, Synergy. An edge node, which is going to take the name of our fictitious plant, Blue Lake. Configure the connection to the hyphen Q broker by copying and pasting the, the URL. And now we're going to <coughs> Authenticate with the broker. Create a new device to publish absolutely everything. So the default path folder is fine, and we need to create also a filter. The default filter is also valid. That rejects expression, which means that it's going to publish everything. And was, something very important now is that we need to enable 
the children's UDT uh, field, which is going to take neurons uh, templates and is going to publish them as PowerPlug templates. Once we save the changes, if we use, for example, MQTT FX, we can see how neuron, or we should see how neuron is publishing everything to the, to the broker. Here it is, and if now we go to Sidewise, we're going to see how the magic happens and how automatically everything is recreated up there. If we go to Assets, we can see how it has already created inverter uh, asset model, it's still creating the weather station asset model, the, the PST, et cetera. And if we go to see the, uh, the instances, we can see how it's mirroring perfectly all the data model we created down in Neuron. We select an inverter. We can take a look at the data that is getting to sidewise in real time. Okay, and we could, we could keep on proceeding the same way. Now let's imagine that have another plant named Green Lake where we've already created the, we've already created the data model. We have pre-configured the connection with Sparkplug and all we have to do is again to enable that connection and it's automatically going to start publishing everything and uh, all the data is going to appear up in, in Sidewise. So to me, that's uh, the magic of Sparkplug, and that's why I like Sparkplug. And uh, that wraps it up for today. So, if you have any questions, you love the magic of Sparkplug, but could you do that with uh, OPC UA, for example? How? What would you be the equivalent of that? With OPC UA. Um, to me, OPC UA is a complex specification. It has many different facets. That's why, uh, in my opinion, doesn't provide as much interoperability as Sparkplug does, because Sparkplug is much uh, clearer when defining the, uh, the topic in space, the payload, and everything. So it's much, uh, it's much easier for uh, manufacturers or software developers to implement it that, than OPC UA. Is to that OPC UA, for example, it can also use uh, can also use MQTT. But who's doing that nowadays? To be honest, I don't know anyone. What's the end value of my Q here instead of the four for example? I prefer hyphen Q first of all because it's a partner to, a partner of ours. <laughs> and secondly, because uh, AWS uh, IoT Core um, doesn't fully implement uh, uh, the MQTT specification, it has some limitations. I know Microsoft they modified their uh, endpoints so that it complies to MQTT5. Yeah. Oh, like I think I but I'm, I'm sure not, it's not going to be fully, fully, fully compliant yet. Any more questions? On the report collection aspect, you said that sometimes the clients want to have their data coming every second. Yeah. Which is opposite to the concept of a as I said, it's extremely weird. I think it's something they ask us to implement because they didn't want it to touch uh, their ETL processes, what they had before with for CSVs. Is it frequent that uh, request from the clients? Is it so difficult for them to accept that we have this report by itself? Yeah, there are some uh, strange use cases out there because there are other clients who are also using that functionality, surprisingly. Yeah.
what, what I find in the report by exception uh, that we could have is that because this is report by exception, as if you've got a big picture and you take pixel by pixel, but at some point on the other side of the, of the planet, at some point you need the entire picture again. So you have to recreate and to find the history. So it's really time consuming to recreate the picture also. So maybe at some point they, they have to, to do that. I don't know. Uh, but at some point, I know we have to, uh, because we send pixel by pixel, we have to recreate the image, to compare, to do aggregation, so it's complicated at some point. Uh, Just to do only report by exception. Maybe. Uh, I like report by exception. <laughs> it's, it's very efficient, especially for these types of assets. Well, again, they are communicating on unreliable networks with a rest very restricted bandwidth, etc., etc. Just, just a comment. So, so to, to get the full picture, um, maybe it's not the way to use uh, MQTT here, but uh, to have a historian database uh, to uh, to store all the the historical yeah. data, yeah. and so you can use this. And one comment on MQTT five uh, on Microsoft. Um, so uh, the, the uh, one disadvantage of MQTT5 is that uh, there are some optional parts of the specification. So Microsoft has the freedom to state that they are fully compliant with the specification, but just by implementing 50% of what is uh, defined in the specification. Exactly. You are talking about the new one? MQTT5. Yeah, the, the new implementation of Microsoft like a few months ago, is that right? Well, there's IoT operations uh, and then there's the event for MQTT record. So event for MQTT record doesn't implement all of the optional Okay, thank you, Jose. I'm going to give you a round of applause.